Good morning. morning. (laughs) It's good to be here. So, uh, we're entering a new season, and um, Mandy's really excited. Uh, She was supposed to be doing the talk today, but because it's a new theme, um, a theme that I'd suggested, I thought it best that I introduce it. (laughs) Or she might not introduce it in the way that I wanted to introduce it. (laughs) So I thought... (laughs) Um, So here I am. I want to thank the worship team for leading us uh, this morning. I want to thank uh, Justine and uh, Ben as well over the weeks that do the words... We really do appreciate what they do. We appreciate those that take the children out, uh, the different teams, because um, they sacrifice. As we found last week, uh, we totally missed the word last week uh, by getting the food ready. And uh, we want to thank and honour those people that serve in the small church. And... um, Jonathan spoke uh, to us after the meal last week about some things that related to being small church and leading. Now, I have to confess, (laughs) I can't remember any of them. (laughs) But, you know, in humility, us preachers and speakers have to remember, it's only for that short 30 minutes or so that we catch people's attention. Sometimes they go home with a little nugget that we've brought. But the reality is, when we go home during the week, we probably forget 99% of what's brought on the Sunday. That's why we have to come back the next week to, uh, to get reminded. And actually, this season is going to be a season where we're not trying to rush each week to, to bring in as much as we can, because we're going to look at one of the great stories of the Bible. And I was listening to a talk this morning on UCB Radio. Um, And the gentleman that was talking talked about how the... He was talking about the Bible and how the Bible has got great stories. And I think we forget that. So often, as church, we can look at themes, serving, perhaps look at serving throughout the Bible as being a theme and how that can inspire us to serve in the church. But the reality is that the Bible is full of the most amazing and inspiring stories that you can imagine. And the guy today spoke about how, how children grow up wanting to be a Jedi Knight. And I heard that and I thought, you know, it's true. Because the Star Wars story is a fantastic story. And in fact, there have been so many th- spin-offs recently of that. It's a great story, isn't it? And children watch those films and think, yeah, I want to be a Jedi Knight. You think of, think of some of the other big stories. Um, Harry Potter. Now, again, I have to confess, I've never seen a Harry Potter film, and I'm not intelligent enough to read one of those books. But... <laughs> They're great stories, aren't they? And have have really captivated so many people. I remember uh, being in York one day, and there was this huge queue to this shop. Oh, what on earth? You know, what on earth? It it was to do with that that this shop was linked with Harry Potter, and there was people from all over the world that were queuing just to go in this shop because it was part of this, the story. We forget the power of stories. You think of Lord of the Rings, the trilogy. Uh, Lisa's been watching uh, the 
the new ones before the, <laughs> the, story, the stories that we know. But think of those stories, how they've captivated and inspired. And I want to say today that there are stories in the Bible that are inspiring, that captivate us and should teach us so many things. And one of those great stories uh, we're going to look over the next few weeks, the story of David. Actually, the reality is, if, if a child wants to be a, a Jedi Knight, surely, surely we need to be telling our children of the story of David and Goliath that should inspire them to say, you know what, whatever comes against me, however big or small I might be, I'm going to face it and I'm going to defeat it. So that's what we're going to do. And in reality, I've only um, got this week and the next two weeks prepared because I'm not sure what direction to take it yet. But as someone who's going to introduce it, the, the whole theme, I thought it better be me rather than Mandy. So... We're going to do something a little bit strange because although we're looking at the character of David over the next few weeks, we're going to look today at two other characters that we need to understand are part of David's story, to understand where they fit in. And we're going to look at Samuel and we're going to look at Saul. And as I've prepared uh, this first talk and thought about the theme, thought about what Jonathan shared about last week. Something has been brewing in my mind about leaders and followers. Leaders and followers. And it struck me, and, and it's something following on from Jonathan really, that in small church, particularly someone like Mandy, needs to recognize that small church has leaders, and some are followers. Some are not called to lead. They are simply followers. But some are leaders. And as Martin had mentioned at the start, it almost seems like days ago, weeks ago really, but it was only Monday, wasn't it, the funeral. And as, we, as I sat and watched... And all you can do is watch something like that. Just the amazing spectacle of honouring uh, the Queen and burying the Queen. It was just an amazing spectacle to just watch. Something that we've not seen before. I was really touched by the fact that the Queen chose... In fact, there was two things I'll say. She chose two hymns that really spoke to me. Love Divine. Isn't it amazing to think that uh, John and Charles Wesley, two of a huge family of children, were brought up in that loving relationship with that, that family. And that, I can't remember what uh, their mum's name was, but... To think that she brought those children up and John and Charles Wesley became so significant through the Methodist movement. And on Monday, they sang uh, Love Divine. What an amazing hymn and testimony that Charles Wesley wrote. And boy, uh, <laughs> Charles's mum must be so proud that however many billion people uh, listen to that song being sung. But the Queen also chose in the planning of the funeral, the Lord is my shepherd. And it got me thinking, Jonathan was really good actually last week at slowing us down and saying, just think about that for a minute. And so I want today to be a bit more slower paced so that I'm not rushing and actually you can think about some of the things that I'm saying. The Lord is my shepherd. Isn't it amazing to think that our queen, a great leader that we have honoured this week, 
should in humility accept that although she is a leader, there is someone that she needed to follow. The Lord is my shepherd. And isn't it amazing too how you find this as preachers, it links so well, doesn't it? Because that was David's psalm. And just as we've thought about the queen over the last few weeks and the role of the monarch, it feels like this week is a turning point in history because the Elizabethan period has ended. And we're going to look today, I'm going to set the scene at looking at one such turning point in Israel's history. Because you see, the Bible is full of stories, but one of the key parts of the Bible is Israel's story. And we're going to look today at maybe a story you know, maybe you don't. But we're going to look at a story today which is one turning point in Israel's history. We look at the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 8 and verse 5. And I think Justine's got this up for us to have a look at. Because this is the key verse today, the second part of it. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Here's the key verse. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. As I've been thinking the last couple of weeks, preparing this, this theme of, of David, has been thinking about the role of monarch, leaders, followers. That passage came to my mind where the people cried out for a king. Where was it? Lo and behold, it's right in the passage that we want uh, to use. God is so good. So the people said... Um, now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. So I want to put that verse into context. So we're going to read 1 Samuel 8, verses 1 to 10. So I'm going to follow Justine. <laughs> we're ready to go. <laughs> so this is, I think, the NIV, isn't it? <clears throat> um, oh, my dog's going to. Right. <laughs> Let me read it. Read it with me. When Samuel, Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them. But warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. Samuel. Samuel's a great character. And a character that I can really associate with. If you know the story of Samuel as a young boy, he was under the uh, leadership of Eli in the house of God. 
And Samuel heard the audible voice of God calling him by name. About 11 years old, I can distinctly remember a voice calling my name. And we used to, I remembered, we had this ladybird book with, with Samuel on the front. <clears throat> and I thought I'd find it out. And I did. Started to read the story, read the story in the Bible. And this, there was this real connection between me and Samuel. Someone so young could hear God's voice. But he didn't know what to do with that voice. He thought it was Eli. He came running to Eli three times. On the third time, Eli realized what was going on, said no. He said, this is what you need to do. He's a great character. How he came to be born, again, another great story with his mother, Hannah. <clears throat> There's so many great stories. But Samuel's story is a great story. And he is God's man at a turning point in the history of Israel. This is a turning point. He was respected throughout his years and throughout Israel, throughout all the tribes of Israel. He was respected, Samuel, as a prophet. But he had many roles. He was a priest. He was a prophet. And he was also a judge. I just want to spend a minute just describing the role of judges. Because throughout Israel's history, from that time of Moses and Aaron and coming out of Egypt, for so many years, for about 400 years, Israel went without a king. And the judges, the judges, uh, God raised up judges as leaders to meet a specific need in a time of crisis. That was the role of judges. Let me give you one example. In fact, I'll throw this into you, Justine. Judges 8, verses 22 to 23. Judges 8, 22 to 23. One judge you might have heard of is Gideon. Okay? But Judges 8, 22 to 23 says, <laughs> there we go, this is Gideon, the Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian, but Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you, the Lord will rule over you. The role of judges was for a specific crisis to meet that crisis, to meet that need. God raised up people who were skilled and trained. Gideon was one. But Gideon made it clear he never wanted to be more than that. He didn't want to rule over them. He didn't want his sons to rule over them. He wanted to remind them that God was their ruler and leader. And that is why Israel went without a king for 400 years. But in Samuel's case, as we go back to 1 Samuel 8, we read there that Samuel appointed his sons. Did you see that when you read it? His sons, Joel and Abijah. Let me just tell you, Samuel had no right to appoint them. God appointed the judges for specific times and specific tasks. Samuel didn't have a right to appoint them. This great man of God, he still made that mistake. And what happens? His sons did not take after Samuel. They were not fit to lead. It says in verse 3 of 1 Samuel 8, they accepted bribes and perverted justice. And so the elders of the tribes of Israel were fed up with how uh, things were going. And they confronted Samuel at Ramah. And Samuel's uh, reaction, it says in the NIV, uh, is that he was displeased. I think it mentions there in the NIV. In the message, it says Samuel was crushed. 
Why? Because his sons had been rejected. Of course he was going to feel that. But in verse 7 of 1 Samuel 8, God comforts Samuel and he says, this is God speaking, it's not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me. So the question is, was it wrong for the people of Israel to ask for a king? You see, we live in an age where the king, the succession of kings and queens is set. But in Israel's history, they'd lived all these years without a king, just with leaders, tribal leaders, judges, prophets, priests to lead them. Now they were asking for a king. Was it right for them to ask for a king? Was it wrong? It's really interesting that some 400 years before, in Deuteronomy 17, the Lord indicates and talks about, God indicates about how the king will be put in place and what needs to happen. So, a king was in God's plan for Israel. It was part of God's plan. But it was their reasons for wanting a king. Sorry. It was a reasons for wanting a king that were wrong. So let's go back to that key verse. 1 Samuel 8 verses 5, the second part of verse 5. 1 Samuel 8 verse 5. They said, now appoint a king to lead us. Why? What, what did they want the king for? Such as all the other nations have. They wanted a king, which wasn't a bad thing, but they wanted it for the wrong reasons. The people wanted to be, the people of Israel wanted to be like the neighboring nations. They wanted a king as their figurehead. In essence, what they were doing was rejecting God as their leader. It says in verses 19 and 20 of 1 Samuel 8, with a king to lead us to fight our battles. Effectively, what they wanted was that, that figurehead to take them into battle, to lead them day to day, and to fight their battles for them. They wanted a king, and in doing so, they were rejecting God. They thought a human monarch instead of God, a new system of government, new laws, an army would bring about a change. One leader, one nation, one army. That's what they were asking for by asking for a king. And I've sim simply put here, be careful what you ask for. This may be a story that we can look at in the Old Testament in the Bible, but it still has relevance to us. And I want to say to you, and I want to challenge you, I want to put this to you to think about. Be careful what you ask for, for God, from God. They asked for a king, and a king was what they got. So, if you follow the story, 1 Samuel 8, 10 to 18, Samuel, following the Lord's instructions, carefully explains what a king will do, how he will lead, how he will treat the people. And 1 Samuel 8, verses 19, if we can bring that up, Justine. <laughs> Sorry to do this to you, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Verse 19, it says, But still, after hearing what the king would be like, it says the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we shall be like all the other nations. You see, the problem is, is that Israel was called to be different. It was called to be distinct, set apart, 
holy. If you read Leviticus 20, you'll see uh, God says, I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. They were called to be distinct and different, separate, unique amongst all the other nations. But here we see at this turning point in history, what did they actually want? They wanted to be just like the other nations. I want to remind you that as church and as people, you are salt and light. We've looked at that over the last few weeks. You, not we, you are salt and light. We are called to be different. You are called to be different. Let's not fall into the trap uh, of trying to be like the world or wanting what the world wants. We have to be different, church. We have to be distinct. We have to be salt, light in a dark world. We have to be a flavor. We have to be different. We can't be like the world. So they wanted a king, and they were rejecting the rule of God. But even in that rejecting God, they couldn't uh, get away and escape from God's authority because he gave them a king. It was still God who would appoint the king. And we had this discussion about, and it could get quite as deep as you want it to, but at this point, couldn't God have chosen David? Because who he chose was Saul. And I want to put it to you that the people demanded a king and God gave them a king. When Saul didn't match up to, to, to God's standards... God then chose his king. I hope you can see what I'm getting at. They wanted a king, so God gave them exactly the person they deserved, a king. And when that failed, God chose the king he wanted. Now, the title of my talk which is, should be coming to an end in about three minutes. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. It's Better Call Saul. It's in homage to my Netflix loving wife, <laughs> who watched the entire box series. I can't even think how many bo uh, seasons there were. But it, I didn't watch it at all. It was way too violent. And... Uh, <laughs> um, it was distracting my biblical studies while I was watching. <laughs> how, could I, how could I study the word? Of it? No. <laughs> With that going on, uh, no. I thought, I'm going to try and give a, a snappy title to each week. So Better Call Saul is the title for this week. And if you've watched it on Netflix, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, God gave them a king. He gave them their king, the one that they wanted. Um, so, let's set the scene. 1 Samuel 9, verses 1 to 2. If we can bring that up, Justine. 1 Samuel 9, verses 1 to 2. <clears throat> it introduces uh, the character uh, of the king. There was a Benjamite, one of the tribes of Israel, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. Verse 2. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be, found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. Else. Saul was a Benjamite. He was clearly tall, handsome, and this was the man that God was going to choose as their king. 
And so if you read 1 Samuel 9, and do, because it's a great story, from 1 Samuel 8 to 15 is what we're looking at today, effectively. Um, 1 Samuel 9 starts with this story of uh, Kish's donkeys going missing. Now you might think, hold on a minute, that doesn't really captivate me too much. But let's put it into some context. If you had a lot of donkeys, you were wealthy. These were the uh, sort of trucks of the, of the modern day that did everything, the donkeys. You needed donkeys to get everything done. And Kish had a lot of donkeys. But the donkeys had gone missing. Now, in house group, you'd probably want to discuss, how can you lose a load of donkeys? Okay. Let me tell you, when I was young, we had a tortoise. I don't know how we ended up with this tortoise, and I'm not making this up, but we really did have a tortoise as a pet. We, it had a little yellow spot on it, so it was quite distinct. Now, I have to tell you that our tortoise escaped. It ran off. <laughs> I don't know how a tortoise can run away, but we lost it. And it ended up down on the high street. Someone found it. I don't know how it had got there. <laughs> so in the same way as we lost a tortoise, I don't know how they lost all these donkeys, but they did. And so as part of the story, Kish, Saul's father, says, take a servant and go and find these donkeys. So he does. He goes and travels all over. And... Um, it, the Bible describes uh, over three days uh, that he went traveling through Ephraim, Shalim, and Benjamin, all those different areas. Um, and the Bible says in chapter 9, when they reached the district of Zuf, Saul wanted to turn back for home. He wanted to go back. But it was his servant that replies in verse 6. So 1 Samuel 9, verse 6, Justine, if we can. 1 Samuel 9, verse 6. But the servant replied, Look, in this town there's a man of God. He is highly respected. And everything he says come true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what way to take. Who do you think that man of God was? It was Samuel, yeah. But reading that, you might miss something really important. It was the servant that knew that Samuel was there. Saul didn't. And throughout this story of Saul, you need to remember, actually, Saul was not particularly spiritual. This was the king that God was going to choose, but he was not a spiritual man. If he was, a bit like the servant, he would have known that Samuel would have been living there in that town they were in. Samuel was a well-respected man of God. And isn't it interesting that even in uh, the servant's quest, he said, you know, perhaps the, the prophet of God will help us know where the donkeys have gone. Would you use your prophets of God today to find out where your tortoise has gone? <laughs> Hope not. But that's how they used the prophets in those days. And so this story goes on. Um, they went up into the town. And as they were entering, it says in verse 14, there was Samuel right in front of them. And when Samuel, in verse 17, it says, when Samuel caught sight of Saul, he heard God's voice say, this is the man. Now, I just want you to take a moment to think. Because it says in verse 16, if we go to the verse before that, so let's put this story together. For three days, Saul... And his servant were looking for the donkeys. On the second day, this happens to Samuel. 
About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him, rule over my, uh, anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. So Saul and his servant are out searching. Samuel, on the second day they were searching, gets this message from God. Tomorrow, you're going to meet someone from the tribe of Benjamin. Anoint him, because he's going to be the new ruler. And on the third day, when the servant reminds Saul, no, actually there's a man of God in this town, let's go and see him. Perhaps he'll help us find these donkeys. They come in, who do they meet in the town? Samuel. Boof, straight away. Samuel sees Saul, says, this is the man. This is the man. I just want to make you think for a minute that even in the ordinary, God can bring about divine appointments. They were searching for donkeys. And what ended up happening was that Saul was anointed as ruler and king. Wow. That's what God does. And I want you to take a moment to think that even now in your lives, God might be doing something in the background that you know absolutely nothing about that tomorrow might change your life. God does that. That's what this story tells us. And so Samuel sees Saul and declares just knows from the voice of God that this is the man. And it says in 1 Samuel 10 verse 1, Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on soil, sorry, Saul's head. <clears throat> There's an anointing and a coronation. Well, we're looking forward in, in months to come towards the coronation. And I seem to recall, and didn't have the chance to look it up, but there is a part of the Queen's coronation where she's surrounded by um, curtains and she's anointed. The public can't see it. It's done in private. It would be interesting to see if that continues with Charles because there is an anointing and a coronation. And as we read the story, we see that uh, there was both. Samuel anointed Saul, and there was this coronation in uh, verses uh, further ahead. Uh, read the story. But as we sort of round it up, because it's only a whistle-stop tour of Saul and Samuel today, he was out looking for the donkeys, meets this man of God, suddenly, bang, he's anointed as king. Completely out of the blue. Saul, as we've seen, not particularly spiritual man. But as we read his story, we see two key weaknesses of Saul. The first is that he constantly felt inferior. He didn't want to face the responsibility God had given him. He struggled with inferiority. God had anointed him through the prophet Samuel, but he didn't want to face up to that. And so we read in 1 Samuel 9, verse 21. Well done, Justine. You're doing a great job. We read this, Saul answered, but I am, not a ben am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing? He was trying to make excuses. Oh, well, I'm only from a small clan. Why choose me? Why say these things? Actually, if you read the history of Benjamin, it was a small clan for a reason. Because they were disobedient. Uh, verse, so that's verse 21. 1 Samuel 10, verse 16. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 10, verse 16, we see this. Saul replied, he assured us that the donkeys had been found, but he did not uh, tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. 
Saul was happy to talk about the donkeys, but he didn't tell his uncle that, oh, oh yeah, something else happened that day. I got anointed as king. Can you believe it? <laughs> he refused to accept that responsibility. And then finally, uh, just one more example of his. Because remember, he was a tall man. He stood out in the crowd. He was handsome. He, he, he really did stand out. 1 Samuel 10, verses 20 to 24. We read this. When Samuel had all, his, uh, had all Israel come forward by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. So this is after Samuel had anointed Saul. Okay? But they still went through a practical process of choosing the king. Then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. Verse 22. So they inquired further of the Lord, has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he has hidden himself among the supplies. What was he doing? He was hiding. He was trying to get out of the responsibility. So inferiority. The second key weakness of Saul is that he was disobedient. And as you read the stories uh, in 1 Samuel um, 13, 14, 15, read them yourselves. Because you will see that on a couple of occasions Saul was disobedient to God. The first occasion, in 1 Samuel 13, we see that Saul, rather than waiting for Samuel, the prophet, the priest, to come and perform a ceremony, as had been agreed between Samuel and Saul, we see that Saul, impatient, said, with the Philistine army coming against him, he thought, no, I better just do this offering myself before I go to battle. Let's present an offering to God. So he did it himself. There's a word of warning to us. Because even though Saul did a good thing, he shouldn't have done it. It was against the law of Scripture uh, to do, bring the offering without a priest being present. He, he did it in the wrong way. And I want to say, we can fall into traps, even in church, of doing good things, but doing it in the wrong way. Don't use that excuse. Ah, oh, but I, I was doing a good thing. You might be, but you might be actually be disobedient. Saul was actually interested in the ritual of the offering. He didn't put his faith in God that waited for Samuel to turn up. Because what happens in 1 Samuel 13 is that no sooner has the offering been brought, Samuel turns up. If only Saul had waited a little bit longer, but he didn't. He was impatient. And he was thinking that the ritual was all that was needed. He substituted the ritual for faith in God. Disobedience. And then if you read 1 Samuel 15, you'll see that Saul has this great battle against the Amalekites. Wins a great victory. But in doing so, the Lord had told him to destroy all the Amalekites. But what happens, if you read, is that Saul and his soldiers keep the best cattle and the best plunder. They get rid of everything else that was worthless and useless. He was disobedient to God. And the reality is that Saul was more interested in what other people think, uh, thought of him than actually being obedient to God. Mandy, 
I want to say to you as leader, don't be interested in what other people think in your church. Don't listen to Lisa and I all the time, just some of the time. (laughs) But don't fall into that trap that Saul did, because there's a real trap. We can think we're listening to the right people, good people, good advice, but actually, if God's told us to go in that direction and do that, but the people are saying, no, do this, we're being disobedient. And it costs Saul his kingship. And because of that disobedience, God rejected him as king, and in doing so, all his relatives would then be stopped from becoming a king themselves. That line was cut. God rejected Saul as king. You can read that in 1 Samuel 15, 26. So, I know I've gone over time. (laughs) A bit of a quick introduction. There's so much to the story of Saul, but it is just an introduction. Because as we start to look at the story of David, you will see that Saul, although he's been rejected as king, he is still king. And you need to understand that. He is still God's anointed king. And as we start to look at the story of David, you will see Samuel. So we need to understand that these two characters are there. We need to understand who they are, their background, and how they can relate. You see, even as God was rejecting Saul as king, in a field in Bethlehem, there was a young man tending the sheep, completely oblivious, looking after the sheep, fighting the bears, keeping his sheep and the flock safe, doing his day-to-day work. Even at that time, this young man was completely unaware that God, the Lord, had already rejected Saul. And he'd looked around and chosen his king to take Saul's place. There's a line in Waymaker's song, Even when I don't see it, you're working. That's the great example. That as Saul was being rejected after the great battle in a field in Bethlehem, God had already chosen who was going to be his king. Even when I don't see it, you're working. And so I'm going to hand over for the next couple of weeks to Mandy who's going to take us through the start of the story of David. And I'm so kind, because I gave her perhaps the greatest story of all in week two, the story of David and Goliath. But actually, my hope is, as we look at this character, you might think you know the story. I thought I knew the story of David. But there is so much. If we're prepared to put the time in and allow God's word to speak to us today, There's so much we can learn from the story of David. So be careful what you ask for, church. They wanted a king. God gave them a king. Yeah? Be careful what you ask for. Amen.